Salutations everybody, it is Maddie here today with my review for Thronebreaker The Witcher Tales by CD Projekt Red. A big thanks to CD Projekt Red for the very early review code for this game, it is much appreciated. Now this game is coming out on PC right now for $30 and it's going to consoles in December. I've been quietly anticipating this game since it was first revealed because I thought the idea of CD Projekt Red spinning off and trying their talents elsewhere outside of the open world RPG genre would be cool. But to also make Gwent with a campaign attached to it in an overworld? Well, let's get into it and see how it did, shall we? You play as Meeve, Queen of Lyria and Rivia, who is hell-bent on driving the Nilf Guardians from her lands. She is powerful, well-acted, and carries herself like a ruler without the cliches wrapped in so many of these vengeful war plots. As you learn more about Meeve, the people who join her, the army itself, and the cruelty of the Nilf Guardians, a connection is slowly established. Now, Thronebreaker is comprised of five diverse maps for the player to explore in cell shaded fashion, which is beautiful in its own right, roughly taking about five to six hours to complete each one, leading to just about above or below 30 hours, depending on your playstyle and how much optional content you engage in. Each of these maps are loaded with encounters, collectibles, puzzles, and choices to make that will have immediate and long-standing consequences. All characters in this game come in the form of cards, so if you're to make a decision that is enough to make a companion call it quits, you will lose that card as well, which adds a superb immediate impact to the gameplay as you enter the deck editing menu, hoping to plug the hole your morally gray choice just opened. Yes, Thronebreaker may be a card game on the surface, but the story here has over 20 end states where choice and consequence is ever prevalent in CD Projekt Red fashion. As you form alliances and make enemies, the world shapes around your decisions, and there were some moments that really wowed me. We've seen choice and consequence really gain steam in our industry, which is great, but CD Projekt Red has such a grip on how to handle the mixture of immediate and distant impact to give both weight and added consideration to every choice the player can make. Now, given the politics, backstabbing, and relationships that this game very much leans on, you can be left really kicking yourself for screwing someone over, trusting someone, or even helping someone out. Yes, playing the good guy often can work you over in this game, which makes you think, do you want to maybe leave a bunch of prisoners behind because it'll drain your supplies, and since you're busy taking care of them, morale for your army will go down. Now, if the morale for your army goes down, that plays a big factor into the cards because if morale is up, every card gets a plus one power boost, but if it's down, every card gets a minus one boost, and that can make or break a lot of battles because once you start peppering the field with cards, that's a lot of additional card power that can just win you a match. The game is clearly aware of all of this because each choice that is made, it tells you that you've selected one evil over another. Now every choice isn't as morally gray as that self-proclamation makes it out to be, but a good deal are, and that's what really pulled me into this world. Admittedly, I am not fully in on the Witcher lore, I'm not totally engaged with it, but I found this game interesting on its own because of the characters and the situation that was painted out for it. I think that fans of the Witcher series who have read the books and have wondered about never before seen locations in this series are gonna be right at home and in love with what CD Projekt Red is delivering here. Now the only issue here with the game's story is feeling connected to certain moments. Often, epic parts of a battle are delivered in an albeit well voice acted text box. Once again, this will lean on your imagination, and there are cutscenes from time to time or character models exchanging dialogue, so don't fret too much. Now, the relieving aspect here is that the writing is gripping, descriptive, and oozes atmosphere, which naturally paints that picture that you need in your head. This is a necessity for this style of storytelling, and while it stumbles at times, it absolutely gets the job done for those who can get down with it. There's also plenty of artwork in the game, too, that shows showcases these epic moments, whether it's a quick optional objective or an actual main story moment, all of them are downright gorgeous, all of them really paint the scene and what is happening there. I imagine the reason that CD Projekt Red took this path over a ton of cutscenes is because it saved production time and allowed them to add an extra sense of choice and consequence, once again alluding back to the past of those point and click adventure titles. The core theme of this story, if you couldn't tell at this point in time, is trust. The deciding factor of that is your choices, which really put the pedal to the metal when it comes to character development. All in all, seeing Meeve's tale through is well worth it, and I can easily see this title just sliding onto my Game of the Year list. But as you can see with all of this, Thronebreaker is more than just a card game expanding on Gwent. 
exploration is reminiscent of those isometric RPGs as you navigate the map interacting with everything and everyone in your path. Often the loop you'll find yourself in is stopping in a nearby town, you view the bounty board, and then the map will be peppered with objectives which you can chase down that I listed earlier. Let's get into those a little bit, shall we? To put it straightforward, Thronebreaker The Witcher Tales has some of the most genius game design in a title I've experienced this year, especially hands down in all of the card games I've taken a delve into both physical and digital, especially in the digital realm. This one is instantly king. It is all based off the Gwent minigame from Witcher 3, but it has received some twists in what the system can actually handle and offer to the player based off specific role sets. Normally, battles carry out over the course of three rounds as you and your opponent attempt to build the biggest armies possible. Each card has special effects and a power number. Simply enough, if your power number is higher than that of your opponent, you're going to win the round. However, sometimes losing a battle to win the war is a key part of the strategy in Gwent. Because if you don't do so, you'll overplay your hand, you'll dominate your opponent for one round, and then they can just easily storm back and take the last two rounds and win that all out battle. Now that's just a standard battle. There are also shortened battles, puzzles, story battles, and boss fights. Puzzle battles give you a specific set of cards and objective like wiping out all the enemies or creatively deploying your forces, letting you toy around through trial and error. There was also one I experienced with Gascon, who was a bandit that joined my group where he had to stealthily escape a certain area and I had to figure out what was the best way to get around the guards and the way that the game handled it was once again a stroke of genius that I alluded to earlier. However, that was only available because I kept Gascon in my party till that point in time. There are also shortened battles which only last for a round and force you to end the fight quick but involve a lot more action and hand spending rather than playing in a conservative manner. Now boss fights are where I feel the true brilliance of CD Projekt Red really shined. A good example is when I was battling a Manticore. Admittedly, the game relies a bit on that player imagination to conjure up a scene in their head of this epic battle taking place, but noting that the Manticore's wings have special abilities compared to its claws and tail led me to carefully consider my options when attacking. After a bunch of experimentation, I learned that if I took down its wings, the enemy had technically landed, so the head would be exposed, thus when I took that out, it eliminated all of him, not forcing me to whittle down the power of all the other parts represented in the cards. There was also another time that a commander had joined the field and naturally his power comes from his men. So anytime I took out one of his men, he lost 10 power. Granted, he had 75 power, so I was instantly being dominated by the opponent, but as I whittled the forces down around him, he became a lot more manageable. It made sense in context, but it also added that little bit of imagination to the game and made you go, ah, right, right. It's this recipe of CD Projekt Red creativity and a dash of player imagination that makes for such rich card battles to partake in. The early going in the gameplay is a bit slow in the understanding department as the game jams you up pretty fast with some complex battles, a lot of puzzle battles, but as you quest more, complete more and more battles and progress in your main quest, you'll unlock unlock plenty of cards, which enable you to hop into your command tent, jumbling up your deck a little bit, leading to a sense of player progression in the mid to late game that is much better than how it starts off as. It takes some patience, but once you have that aha, I get it moment, the player really gains some steam, and I imagine this will diversify from each player. Now when you set up this camp, adjusting your deck isn't the only thing you're able to do. You can invest resources like gold and materials, soldiers as well, that you collect in the world through either questing, battles, recruiting them from towns, and you can dump those into upgrades for cards you build, or you can lower the cost for other cards that you put in your deck so that as the game goes on, you're actually able to build a bigger, more expansive, diversified deck. You can increase map speed exploration, and there is so much more there. I found all the upgrades useful, practical, and depending on your playstyle, each had their real own uses. Maybe you want to focus on traps. Maybe you want to be more of a guerrilla warfighter. Maybe you want to ambush your opponents. Maybe you're just a straight up tank and you want to take your opponent on head first. It's all up to you. On top of that, you can find a spot in your camp where you can converse with main party members that you've gathered along the way based off your choices and optional content you engaged in. Since none of these members are permanent in the Witcher Tales, I found the conversations engaging and if things weren't to go my way, I'd miss that companionship from said player character. My favorite character next to Meeve is easily Gascon, as he has a cryptic backstory, an ace up his sleeve, and highlights honor among thieves. Not that the other characters are bad, do not get me wrong, hell, they're all interesting 
interesting if given the time, but Gascon really struck a chord with me because of its mysterious yet whimsical nature. What's cool about all of this is that it ties into the multiplayer version that's free to play for Gwent, where if you find certain chests in the overworld, you can unlock cards for Gwent on top of borders, avatars, etc. I like this connection here because it gave a little bit of extra motivation for players to get involved in the single player aspect of Gwent, we'll call it. Now, one thing I cannot attest to because I haven't played enough multiplayer Gwent in my lifetime is that will these cards you unlock in the single player game be so overpowered that they might upset the balance in the multiplayer aspect? That's something we're going to have to see over time and find out and I cannot answer at this moment. Lastly is the audio that I love to focus on and this game relies on that heavily with little sound effects during these text box storytellings. It's not just the voice acting but maybe hearing the crackling of a fire, the clashing of a sword, the stomps of an enemy running at you. Every sound is accounted for where pretty much what they're doing is having you listen to an old school radio show. They never let dead air occur unless it's trying to build tension or anxiety for the moment itself and as I've attested to multiple times the game is well voice acted which it absolutely needed to be it seems like a very self-aware title they know what they had to address and where to dump the resources in which was clearly audio big time as well as art and they did just that so all in all my verdict for this game is this is simply a must buy you have a 30 plus hour campaign for a $30 game a lot of choice and consequence over 70 quests 20 end states, brilliant game design. If you are into card games or you're open to trying one out for the first time, this is the best place to go. It's a low risk investment. There isn't a single microtransaction to be found inside this title. There's no in-game store. Everything you have in this title is earned through playing the game. So a tip of the cap to CD Projekt Red for not only doing it right, but moving yet another genre forward. This is depth in an unexpected area and I welcome it. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. If you have any questions, do fire away in the comments down below and I'll catch you guys next time. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, like me on Facebook. Those links are in the description down below along with my Patreon. Do consider supporting that as it fuels all the content we create here. Stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.